Next, from Springfield, Ralph Martiri, Executive Director of the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, talks about the state budget, its taxes, and spending, and examines how Illinois' taxing policies compare with neighboring states. Mr. Martiri argues that Illinois' taxing policies have fallen behind, and the result is there's not enough money for vital state services. In 2010, the state passed a pension funding bill for the unfunded police and fire pension systems in the municipalities across the state of Illinois, imposing on them a very steep ramp. That ramp kicks in this fiscal year. So the very year that municipalities are going to see a significant increase in the demand on their revenue streams, the governor is proposing cutting their share of the local government distributive fund by $600 million and freezing their property taxes. Okay. I don't know. I mean, we don't, that's what we do at the center. Right? We work on fiscal policy, and when we try to talk about that rationally, pros and cons, we're like, really? Next, cuts to general fund services. Some of these he will probably get, but not all of them. The largest cuts in here are to human services, Medicaid, and higher education. Those are the three things that were singled out for the biggest cuts. The Medicaid cuts are particularly problematic. It's, he's expecting to save well over $800 million in the Medicaid program. By going back to the exact same Medicaid cuts the state passed a couple of years ago under something called the SMART Act. Well, because the Medicaid program is jointly funded between the states and the federal government, the feds have to approve any changes you make to the Medicaid program, particularly cuts in services or eligibility. They've already said no to every single one of the cuts he wants to reinstall, which is why, in fact, we're doing them. We tried to cut them. The Fed said no. I have not seen the Obama administration back away much from Medicaid expansion, question whether or not the Obama administration is going to okay these cuts. So of this $1.5 billion in savings, he might get four or $500 million. That's the most. So you take away everything else that he's suggested, and you're really looking at a budget deficit somewhere in the 9.7 to $10.1 billion range because what he has put on the table to save money simply isn't going to happen. Legally, has already been turned down by the feds or is on its face unconstitutional. Here's a comparison between the governor's proposed budget and the Dems' proposed budget. And you can see his cuts. You go by line item, higher education, he would cut by $355 million more than uh, what the Dems would do, et cetera, et cetera. Why these are problematic? The, the state general fund budget really has two elements. It's got something we call hard costs. These are three items. It's our debt service. It's those statutory transfers out, primarily two things. It's the local government distributive fund, and it's some Medicaid transfers required by law to trust funds. That's about 98% of the statutory transfers out. And it's the pension contribution. We call those hard costs because there's no discretion over them, right? By law, they have to be funded at the General Assembly level. And we have a roughly $35 billion general fund, 11 billion of which is hard costs. So now you take those hard costs off the table. The entire deficit is in the softer cost. It's current services. Because you have to pay those top items by law, meaning if you have any deficit, it's where you have some discretion to spend. Now, where we have discretion to spend, historically, the state spends nine of, out of its $10 on four things, education, health care, social services, and public safety. You see two other big lumps of expenditures here. Group health, the health insurance the state maintains on its workers, consumes 5% of the budget, and literally everything else. Environmental protection, parks and rec, economic development, ag, all that other stuff down here. Administrative costs, right? So to the extent there's not, the administrative costs themselves aren't included in the direct disbursement to the agencies, they're in that other category. So really, we've got an accumulated deficit of just over $10 billion in roughly $24 billion of spending. We're approaching a 50% deficit level. That's significant. And, and there's been a lot of noise that the reason we have these deficits in Illinois is profligate spending or out of control spending. I just wanted to 
kill that. So I threw a few slides in here on the spending side of the ledger to make it abundantly, abundantly clear spending is really not the problem in Illinois. These are the nominal dollar appropriations by fiscal years from fiscal year 09, first year after the Great Recession, through fiscal year 2015 on all services that aren't hard costs. So these are literally our what we've been voting to appropriate our money to, nine out of ten dollars, education, health, etc. You see a direct line decrease in spending. It's just about three billion in cuts. This is nominal dollars. It hasn't been adjusted for inflation. You see one tiny uptick here. There's two things in this uptick. Number one, when the Fed said no to those Medicaid cuts, we had to add them back into the budget. That was just over half of it. The remaining part, Remember I told you group health is 5% of the budget? The state has never accurately budgeted for its full group health liability. Never. It's one way they make the budget appear healthier than it is and they can spend more money than they have is by simply under-appropriating what they know the true liability to be, okay? So Senate President Cullerton a few years back said, you know what? We're going to change that. That's not good government. It's not transparent. So for the last few years, you've seen an increase in the group health line in the state's general fund budget. No increase in liability. In fact, we still haven't gotten to the full liability amount. That's the other part of this bump. More accurate budgeting for group health and the federal government saying no to Medicaid cuts. In other words, there's been no voluntary increase in spending over the 2009 through 2015 sequence. What has gone up over this sequence <clears throat> is our hard costs. Remember, there's three of those. Debt service, the pension payment, and the statutory transfers out. The blue bar down here is our debt service. It went from 1.2 billion, we had no debt service other than that in the general fund, to 2.2 billion. This is almost all pension obligation bonds, short term issued to pay our pension contribution and that we're paying back. The red bar in the middle or orange or whatever kind of color that is, those are the statutory transfers out. The local government distributive fund primarily where we share income tax revenue with local governments. Medicaid transfers required by federal law that have to go to trust funds. That's about 95, 98% of those. So that's what those statutory transfers are. And then this weird color at the top, it, it is gray in my PowerPoint. I don't know really what to call that. That's the pension contribution. Notice how much that has risen. This is that backloaded ramp you've heard me talk about before, if in fact you've heard me talk before, and if you stayed awake, you are a great American. So <laughs> this is jumping tremendously, but I want to be very clear, it's got nothing to do with the cost of benefits. In fact, of that $6.8 billion figure for this year, which is now going to be changed because they've had some changes, but that's what it was projected to be for 2016, and that's the last number we have. Of that $6.8 billion figure, roughly $1.5 billion is the normal cost of funding benefits. The remaining $5.3 billion is debt repayment to the pension system. This is that ramp that was passed in 1994 that backloaded payments, right? We are in the increasing part of the backload, and you can see it very clearly here. And I just want to make, now this is COGFA's data, the Commission on Government Forecasting and Accountability's data. I just want to make it entirely clear that benefits and salaries, and in fact the pension systems themselves, are not the cause of this unfunded liability, nor why we have issues. So using the state's own data, this is the dollar amount of different items that have contributed to the growth in the unfunded liability from 1995 through 2013. Salary increases were negative. In fact, a billion dollars was reduced from our unfunded liability. Benefit increases caused an $8 billion bump up. Total, 7% of the growth in the unfunded liability over that, secret is, uh, over that sequence is due to salaries and benefits. These are other factors inherent to the pension systems, changes in assumptions, changes in discount rates, you pesky public sector workers living a lot longer than we really want you to. <laughs> All that kind of stuff. And then there's the Great Recession. Okay? 
Everybody had a hard time during the Great Recession, Ed just did the pension system, so they lost a lot of the value of the assets that they'd purchased before that, $17 billion worth of loss. If you added all these factors together, it included the Great Recession, mind you, and those were the only problems with our pension systems, we'd be about 68 to 70 percent funded today. There would be no crisis. In 30 years, you could take care of the problem, no issue using a standard arc. Ah, here's the principle of the debt borrowed against the normal cost over that same sequence, $45 billion. Doesn't include the interest on this principle. This is the principle borrowed. That's why we have an unfunded liability. The pension ramp that was passed back in 1994 was very disingenuous. While the individuals who supported it claimed that what it really was was a pathway towards getting the pension systems healthy, 90% funded in 50 years if they made all the payments in that amortization schedule, what it really was was a crafty way of codifying the practice of borrowing against the pensions for the next 15 or 16 years and leaving it to future generations to deal with fixing the problem. So in fact, by law, that pension ramp statutorily continued the practice of underfunding the pensions from 1995 through 2008. In fact, through 2014, that's the first year we made the full contribution plus debt service. Well, there's your problem. But interestingly enough, the pension systems are actually a symptom of the real problem that plagues Illinois. We're not overspending on services, and yet every single year we don't have adequate revenue growth to maintain the same level of services we provided in the prior year to the next year. Just don't. We've had this structural imbalance between our revenue growth and our service cost growth since at least the early 80s. It was first identified actually by the Institute of Government and Public Affairs. I'll point out, and some fantastic research that was done to that organization. Mr. Rich is here, wave, shake, one of the brilliant heads of the Institute of Government and Public Affairs. But I mean, the bottom line is we've had this structural imbalance for a long time. And because of it, legislators decided, well, they didn't want to fix tax policy to fund services. They sure didn't want to cut education, health, social services, and public safety to the bone, because that's not a pathway to re-election. Why not? instead of either dealing with taxes and solving the problem or eviscerating your current spending on services, simply borrow against what you owe the pensions. It's relatively arcane. It doesn't affect a lot of people in the state. Voters don't understand it. And the problem doesn't come home to the roost for generations. That is brilliant public policy for a politician. <laughs> Not so much for us, but for politicians it's brilliant. And that's what happened. So the other interesting reality about our unfunded pension liability, and, and taxpayers don't understand. The pensions have subsidized the cost of service delivery for generations. Taxpayers have consumed education, health, social services, and public safety without paying the full cost thereof in taxes for generations. And if we'd have borrowed that money from banks, I'm guessing no one would be kvetching that we should find a way to not pay it back, right? But because we borrowed it from the retirement security of our public sector workers somehow, some way, it's okay to not pay it back. I don't get that. I don't get that argument from a good government standpoint. I don't get it from a legal standpoint. Yes, I'm a recovering attorney. And I sure don't get it from a morality standpoint. Now, as for that revenue from the temporary tax increase, it literally kept the wheels from coming off of state government. If you look at the green bars, what you see is what the state's actual accumulated deficit was over the last few years, including that revenue from the temporary tax increase. What the red bar shows you is what our accumulated deficits would be if state law remained exactly as it was in every other area, but we didn't have the revenue from that temporary tax increase. So we cut spending on services like you saw. Our hard costs grew like you saw. Even with those cuts, our accumulated deficit in 2014 would have been 31 billion. Our whole general fund is 35, including hard costs. 
But where the deficit lies in, in the softer costs, the current services, we only spend $24 billion. We'd be running a deficit of over 100% today. Here you can see the fiscal cliff. We've kind of lost the dollar amounts up there, but you can see it's, we, our revenue is dropping from 36 billion to 32 billion, and this is because of the change in law. So it's not helping the state very much to lose revenue. In fact, don't they say when you're at a ditch and you want to get out of it, the first thing you do is stop digging, right? <laughs> and we had a $6.6 .6 billion deficit to begin with, and now we just gave away $4.7 billion in revenue, and somehow, some way, that's going to work or make Illinois grow economically. <laughs> now, it's unfortunate that this whole slide doesn't fit on the screen, so I'd like you to look at this one in a little detail. Not only did the state not benefit from this tax cut, most people didn't benefit either. So, if you, if you looked over here, this represents the bottom 60% of our taxpayers. And what this chart is, is it's net taxable income in Illinois, and we had to do it that, that way because that's how the Illinois Department of Revenue keeps these statistics. And we wanted them to peer review this work, which they did. So this has been peer reviewed by the Illinois Department of Revenue. We know the numbers are accurate. The bottom 60% of taxpayers only got 13% of the dollar value of this tax cut. The bottom 60% got 13%. That's not a lot. Now on the personal level, the tax break was about 3.6, 3.7 billion, another billion in corporate tax relief. Over half of all the tax relief, 54%, went to the wealthiest 11%. Once again, this is just how the data sorted. I couldn't do it 10%. I wanted to. The data didn't sort that way. So the wealthiest 11% in Illinois got over half of the tax relief. Over $2 billion of this $3.7 billion tax relief went to the wealthiest. Number one, they don't need it. Number two, that's not going to stimulate the economy. Number three, this sure isn't a middle class tax cut. And in fact, number four, who do you think pays for this tax cut? It's not the people at the top. Their services will be fine because they live in communities like Barrington and Wilmette and Winnetka and where I live, River Forest. Our local property wealth will make sure that no matter what happens at the state level, our communities are fine. How about people in Peoria and East St. Louis and Marion and, well, you know, their services are going to be cut. So the brilliance of this tax relief is it so damages the state's fiscal capacity that the services that are being cut are in middle income communities who don't benefit from the tax cut. They pay for it, but they don't benefit from it. Millionaires, by the way, this is the bottom line here, and, and to be very clear, millionaires meaning net taxable incomes over a million. So their gross incomes are much higher than that. Millionaires did particularly well. They got 13% of the tax relief. They got an average tax break of $37,000 a year, which just happens to be more than the total taxable income of everyone in the bottom 60%. So this is the cost for people of sharing in that tax relief and the cost to the state. More data on spending. So if you want to say the state is spending more on services today, what you have to use is nominal dollars. This compares 2014, excuse me, 2015 appropriations to 2000 appropriations. If you don't adjust for inflation, look at the blue bar, it appears as if we're spending 19% more on those four core services of education, health, social services, and public safety. We are not. The second you adjust for inflation, that's the middle green bar, that's an inflation metric we used there was the consumer price index, the CPI. In real terms, the state could actually purchase 23% less with what it was spending in 2015 on those four core services than what it spent in 2000. Now the consumer price index is a great inflation metric for the entire economy, but not so much for public sector spending. Why? Well, the entire economy includes things like Twinkies and Clorox bleach and hair care products. And state government really doesn't buy a lot of Twinkies and at least in Spilgoyevich has been going on hair care products. <laughs> what, he was pretty. What state government buys is labor. 
In fact, if you think about it, education, health, social services, and public safety are highly labor-intensive fields. And virtually 70 to 85% of the state's budget every year is the cost of the salaries or the wages of the teachers and the, and the social workers and the health care providers, et cetera. There is an inflation metric tied to the cost of labor over time, the employment cost index. So using the more accurate ECI, it's very clear that we are spending 28% less in real terms on those four core services today than we did in 2000 under Governor Ryan. Hardly an increase. Now, if you just looked at this slide, it's an across the board cut. It doesn't show up on here, which is why I'm flowing, but it doesn't matter the area you have the data here. Go to your favorite public service area, you can see after inflation we're spending less on it in real terms today than we did in the year 2000. Well then, how does Illinois stack up to other states? I mean, is this cutting in spending something rational to do because we're high spending in comparison to our fellow states? Let me think about it, no. So, <laughs> Illinois has the fifth largest economy and fifth largest population of any state. In fact, we have a $720 billion annual economy, pretty big sized economy. That said, we ranked, I don't know, it doesn't show up in here, either 26th, I think it is, or 36th in spending on services, those four core services, depending on whether you looked at per capita or as a percentage of GDP. So right there, and I teach a, a, a course on fiscal policy at the master's level at Roosevelt, and I throw this, data point out there and I ask the class a question. If you have the fifth largest population and you rank in the low 20s to low 30s in spending on services, what is that data telling you? What conclusion can you draw? And they said, really, I gotta think in class. That's usually the initial response. The second response is, and they get to it, is, well, wait a minute. If we have the fifth biggest population but we're ranking down below the midway point, we're not meeting our needs. Exactly right. The state of Illinois, is low spending across the board, especially education and social services. We rank at or near the bottom in literally every category despite our advantage in capacity and our relatively greater size. Illinois has generally decided it doesn't have the political will to raise the taxes needed to fund the services demanded by our demography, period, end of story. That's the data. The most recent year for which there's data, and we've now updated this to 2013, and we still rank where we are, we rank 49th out of the 50 states in the number of state workers per capita. So I don't care which metric you want to use. We're a low spending state that is not meeting demographically driven needs, and we are cutting spending in real terms over time. And since 2009, we've been cutting spending in nominal terms, not even adjusting for inflation. Where's the spending, crazy spending, or, or the other argument, I love that, well first we gotta cut spending before we deal with taxes. Really? Cut what? I think the best quote of this came from Nudig, who's the governor's head of Office of Management and the Budget, in a, in a, he was interviewed in the Chicago Tribune, he said, look, the cuts we're putting on the table aren't cuts that make us more efficient. They're not cutting waste, fraud, or beauty. we're cutting needed program, we just don't have the money to fund it. So that's a policy decision we are making. Our, our, our lack of political will to generate adequate revenue to fund services means we don't care if those services are delivered. Oh, I, I do want to do one part of this one. Our economy is so large, we'd actually, if we're an independent country, that $720 billion economy, we'd have the 20th largest GDP of any nation in the world. So we have some capacity to go after and tax. That said, despite having this large economy, our economic growth on a percentage basis has lagged the United States. This goes back 15 years. It doesn't matter what period you pick, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Illinois lags the rest of the nation over that sequence in economic growth. And is it because we tax ourselves to death? No, it is not. Over that entire sequence, going back 15 years, we ranked in the bottom 10 in total state and local tax burden as a percentage of income in the nation, and second lowest in the entire Midwest. So we're a low taxing state that has yet to see any economic benefit from being low tax. And now, one of the primary public policy prescriptions for growing our economy is to cut taxes even more. 
<sighs> Has anyone looked at Kansas? Anyone? <laughs> right? Oops. Oh. We've had trouble with the technology today. Here's where we rank nationally in total state and local tax burden as a percentage of income, 42nd at the last in 2010. Compare that to Missouri, which was the only state in the Midwest lower than us. Now, why 2010 was an interesting year? It's before our temporary tax increase. Our economy was still in the tank. And in fact, it's the first full year of recovery following the Great Recession, which technically ended in June of 2009. So calendar year 2010 is the first full year of recovery. In that first full year of recovery, look how we did economically in growth. Second worst in the Midwest to Missouri. Worse than all our higher tax neighbors. In fact, the two lowest taxing states did the worst job growing their private sector economy coming out of the Great Recession in the first full year of recovery. Why would that be? Here's why. You already kind of know. What does state government really spend its money on? Wages. 70 to 85 percent of the general funds funding for services is compensation, right? What is the private sector economy? It's consumer spending. 68 to 70 percent of all economic activity at the state level, at the federal level, are people like you and me buying junk and such. That's the economy. So when state government cuts spending, it's cutting wages and salaries. So people have less to spend in the private sector economy, so they spend less. And that hurts private sector businesses, so your economy doesn't grow as rapidly as states that didn't have to make as significant cuts as you did. The data are entirely consistent with that. And by the way, this isn't my analysis purely. It's based on the analysis of a guy named Mark Zandi. Do you know who Zandi is? He's the top bond rating agent, PhD economist at Moody's. And he's no liberal. When Republican Senator John McCain ran against Barack Obama for the presidency the first time around, Zandi was McCain's principal economic advisor. So he's a Republican PhD economist working at a bond rating agency. No liberal, okay? <laughs> he found, his analysis has very much found that you get a negative economic multiplier if you cut taxes at the state level and pay for those with spending cuts. Because no matter what bump you get from the tax break, it is superseded by, it is exceeded by, the economic loss you get from the spending cut. Virtually every peer-reviewed academic journal that's looked at this has come to the exact same conclusion, including the Cato Institute, once again, not very liberal, and the Kauffman Foundation for Entrepreneurship, not very liberal. <laughs> All right. Then how about our corporate taxes? Is that what's killing our economy? No. You see our, new, our, our high rate was 7% until 2015. That was the temporary inflated rate. It went up from 4.8 to 7%. And then on January 1st of this year, our corporate tax rate went back down to 5.2%. Here is the corporate tax rate in various states. You see our Midwestern neighbors and other big states. What I find compelling about this is look at Indiana, Wisconsin, and New Jersey. 8.5%, 7.9%, and 9%. The governors of every one of those states, after we temporarily increased our corporate rate to 7%, held a press conference in Chicago and said, now your businesses are going to come to my state because you raised corporate taxes. <laughs> to a level still below their state. <laughs> Our new temporarily high rate is still lower than the state rates in Indiana, New Jersey, and Wisconsin. And nobody called them on it. We tried. And interestingly enough, the Chicago media was not interested in the numbers. Read Tribune. So then we looked at how much of a problem corporate income taxes are at the state level for every business in the country that has to pay them. And you can get this data from the Internal Revenue Service. 44 states in America have a corporate income tax, six do not. Getting the data from the IRS, 
we looked at how much every single business in America paid in state corporate income taxes to all 44 states that have one. And we divided that amount, so here's your total taxes paid. We divided that amount by net corporate taxable income. Not their gross income, their taxable income. To see what their effective tax rate was, their tax burden. 2.07%. Nationally, all state corporate income taxes create a tax burden for business of 2.07% of their net taxable income. And somehow, magically cutting this is going to be what stimulates our economy. Is, no one is looking at the numbers. Of course it's not going to stimulate the economy. There's not enough there. That, Illinois is 0.06% of this. That's what we're hacking into as far as corporate state income tax burden goes. Now we had a jobless recovery, which is why everyone wants to cut taxes to stimulate jobs and hiring, right? But I'm saying the additional money businesses would get from that tiny little tax cut is not gonna be the magic straw that breaks the camel's back based on the data. So here are growth in corporate profits versus national GDP versus labor income from 1972 through 2012. 2012 didn't make it on the map, but it's there. Corporate profits seem to have recovered quite well from the Great Recession. Here's their little dip down, you see it? And now they are at an all-time record high. Here's GDP growth, here's labor growth. If businesses wanted to hire people, they're sitting on adequate resources to do so. Their choice not to isn't because they don't have the money. It's because there's not the demand for their product or services. I know that sounds like an outrageous proposition, but the Congressional Budget Office actually did a thorough study of everything that may or may not have a statistically meaningful correlation to businesses hiring more people from a government policy standpoint. They really couldn't find anything, federal tax policy even, that mattered. Apparently the only thing that mattered was when a, the demand for a business's product or services increased to the point where that business needed to hire more capacity to meet the demand. Who'd have thought businesses would operate that way? <laughs> Now, from a public policy standpoint, I, I want to be very clear. There is no statistically meaningful correlation between a state's tax policy and its economic growth at all. There is none. You should just design your state tax policy to work. There are two public policies that state decision makers can vote on which actually over time do have a meaningful correlation to competitive economic growth. That is a state growing its median wage, its jobs, its state GDP per capita at faster rates than other states and than what you would assume giving its share of the national economy. Those two things are infrastructure and public education. The states that do the best job investing in those two things actually see an economic benefit from that. States that don't, not so much. Now, Illinois has been very low tax for a very long time. You've seen that. Our economy has not been competitive over the same period of time we've been low tax. How have we been on investing in education? Not so good. Our basic starting point for public education funding, K-12 at least, is something called the foundation level. Now, a lot of you in, in here probably know what that is, but I'm gonna get that in a little detail, right? The foundation level is the minimum expense per kid for education, K-12, established by the General Assembly. Our foundation level in Illinois is based on nothing. It's not based on one cost of actually educating children. Now, Governor Edgar in the middle 90s decided nothing was not the strongest predicate for education funding. So he decided to appoint EFAB, the Education Funding Advisory Board. And EFAB's whole job was to take this foundation level and tie it to the cost of educating children to meet a specified academic standard. Makes some sense. 
The standard selected, so to be very clear, this is not where we are at. This is what we aspire to be. This is what we are shooting for in Illinois. Is what would it cost per kid to purchase an education of sufficient quality to get two thirds of our non at risk children passing the state's tests? Breaking that down, it's to get two thirds of our kids passing the state's tests. There's that federal law, no child's behind is left. Or what, no, NCLB, <laughs> to be very clear, requires you to have 100% of your kids passing tests. So we're, we're not even worried about trying to fund the federal law. Number two, it's not even two thirds of all kids. It's two-thirds of non-at-risk children. At risk is a term of art in education funding. It means at risk of academic failure. And there are three types of kid that fall into that category. Kids that are low income, kids that are English language learners, and kids that are special needs. Over 50% of our state right now of the children attending our public schools are at risk. You should know that our an aspirational education funding goal doesn't take into account the cost of educating these children at all. Apparently, our aspirations don't include them. So now to focus on what our aspirations do include, it's getting two thirds of the children with a reasonable likelihood of academic success passing our state's test. Based on that standard, our actual foundation level in 03 was $120 less per child than the EFAB recommended. In 2015, it was $2,700 less per kid. Per kid. Fifth richest state, richest country in the world, 20th largest economy in the world. Now we've run this through the state funding formula at ISBE, the Illinois State Board of Education, and it's just about $4 billion to fill this gap. So today in Illinois, our starting point for K-12 funding is around $4 billion less than what it would cost to get two-thirds of our children with a reasonable likelihood of academic success passing the state's tests. We have determined at the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability that that is inadequate. I'm willing to hear the counterpoint. Hearing none, I will move on. The brilliance of Illinois' poor education funding starting point is that once they set it, they then don't bother to pay for it. So, Illinois is in the red, the rest of the states on average are in the green. Illinois only covers 28% of school funding from state-based resources. The rest of the nation, on average, 45% of education is covered at the state level, which means 63% of the cost of public education is paid for by local property taxes in Illinois, whereas 44% is the national average. The differential, if you add 28 to 62, you don't get to 100. The missing 10% is what the feds cover. In case you're curious, we are 50th in the country in the portion of education funding paid for by the state. We are first in reliance on local property taxes. So we've effectively tied the quality of public education a child receives in Illinois to the property wealth of the community in which the kid lives. <clears throat> kid lives in a property wealthy community, River Forest, I'm on the school board, world-class education, come visit our schools, I will brag about them all day long, but then again, we pay 83% of the cost of our public education out of our property tax base in River Forest. Then go right next door to Maywood or Bellwood or Austin and see what those schools are like. Now, Underfunding education when education is more important than ever to being competitive in a modern economy is a really bad idea. This is, and the red again is Illinois, the yellow is the Midwest, and this is the US. These are the unemployment rates for individuals by academic credential. Less than high school, very high unemployment rates, straight line down, bachelor's degree or more, very low unemployment rates, right? direct line correlation. The only exception here is for art history majors and no one's gonna help them. <laughs> the new trend in education of what's changed is now academic or educational attainment is also correlated to wage. So the only cohort of workers in America and Illinois who have seen their incomes increase at a rate greater than inflation since 1980 have a college degree. Every other worker is earning less today than they did in 1980. The other thing we know about our labor markets, 
is that the wage gap between whites and minorities in our state keeps getting worse, not better. So the wage gap between whites and Latinos grew since 1980 by 37%. Some of that is poor education policy, some of that is discrimination. Some of that is neutral labor market forces at play. You think about Latinos, you have a significant immigrant population that's willing to take very low paying jobs. You've got English as a second language concerns and as a demographic, as a cohort in the labor market, Latinos are both the youngest overall and the least educated, both of which are indicia of being qualified for only lower paying jobs. So there's a lot of complex stuff going on in that data point. Then there's the growth in the wage gap in Illinois between whites and blacks of 197% over this same sequence. As far as neutral labor market forces go, I've got nothing. Two things happening here, discrimination, and it doesn't matter how you slice the data, you see racially disparate outcomes that can only be dis explained by discrimination impacting that labor market, and how we fund schools. Because remember, we've tied the quality of the public education a kid's gonna receive to the property wealth of the community in which the kid lives. Well, 55% of our black kids live in the 5% of school districts with the greatest poverty and the lowest property values. 93% of our black kids live in a school district where the concentrated low income percentage is 30 or greater. Low income becomes a real expensive cost for public education at about 20%. What this means is that while Illinois starts at a woefully inadequate place for education funding for most of its kids, so most kids, if you're middle income or below, you're probably not getting a very good education or at least the kind of education you should be getting. There's always exceptions, right? Middle income or below, we're not doing a good job. African American kids on average start off with $1,100 less spent on their education every single year, K through 12, than do their white peers because they are so segregated in these low property wealth communities. So despite starting off low for everyone else, Illinois has really singled out blacks for a poorly funded education. And education matters more than ever to being competitive in a modern economy. If you do that for generations, your, your black high school grads are not going to be competitive with their white peers for going on and credentialing themselves and getting those higher paying jobs. That will show up in your wage data, and it has. <clears throat> and the reason is tax policy. Because the state refuses to raise adequate tax revenue it has pushed the burden for education down to local property taxes. And here's one real truth about fiscal policy. Where needs are greatest, resources are least. So when you make this tax policy decision, you will create a highly inequitable society. That's our decision, and we're sticking with it because we don't want to change tax policy. And by change, I mean increased taxes at the state level. So, Illinois has, and a lot of you have seen this before, that would be dollar amounts going north and south, east and west, you see the years. An honest fiscal problem. It's got a structural deficit. Just focus on the blue and the red bars. This is the only piece of modeling that I've included so far. Everything else we've done is something we like to call math, with publicly available data sets, <laughs> that you can do yourself. This was modeling. Uh, we don't like to do a lot of modeling because assumptions can jury rig outcomes. Uh, all you folks know that very well. We had this peer reviewed by four different independent academics, including two at the Institute of Government and Public Affairs, by the way, and the head of state and local tax at the GAO in Washington, DC. They've all peer reviewed it and said it's a solid model. It works. It does precisely what it says it does. Our assumptions are very simple. We assume historic rates of inflation. We assume historic rates of population growth, we assume normal economies, we assume no change in law. Okay? Continuation of current law. The red bar shows you what happens to our revenue adjusting for inflation and population growth. If we started with a balanced budget, you now know that we didn't. The blue bar shows you the cost of maintaining our current services adjusted for inflation and population growth and assuming a normal economy and our current debt load. That we don't adjust for anything. It is what it is. We know the debt schedule. We stick it in. The gap between the red bar and the blue bar, the revenue growth and the cost growth, is the structural deficit. It's built into the structure of how we tax versus the cost of the services and the debt that we've incurred. The yellow bar shows you what would have happened if we made the temporary tax increase permanent. That would be our new revenue line. You can see it helps solve some 
of the problem, but you still see a structural imbalance. Why? Our tax policy was not designed to work in a modern economy, and we are living in a modern economy, and so that dog won't hunt. The couple of things we need to do from a tax policy standpoint, and unfortunately my one slide is not at least showing up here, I hope you have it in there, on reamortizing the pension debt. Real simple. Our backloaded pension debt that has these payments that jump like this, I showed you on that earlier slide, from year to year in increments that no tax system could afford, needs to be thrown out the window. It's a creature of statute. It's a fiction. It's not based on one thing, actuarial or otherwise. We owe it to our own pension systems. The way we fix it is we change the flippin' law. That's all we got to do. What we have suggested, and we've run the numbers, it's in your PowerPoint, it wasn't shown up here, is we've leveled out that payment. So instead of it ever increasing, it's kind of like a mortgage, right? The same dollar amount every single year. But our dollar amount is enough to accomplish a couple of things. It's enough to grow the funded ratio in all five pension systems to the point where they become healthy. And in fact, in 30 years, they are somewhere between 76 and 78% funded, almost healthy. 80% is healthy according to the CBO. If you want them 100% funded, it takes about 43 years. But it does that while accommodating all cash flow obligations for current and future retirees, meaning every benefit gets paid without anyone even suggesting they be cut. And it does all that without demanding too much in tax revenue. Because if you demand too much in tax revenue to fund your pensions, here's the problem. That tax revenue has education, health, social services, and public safety competing to get it. And pensions have generally lost that competition over the years as politicians find a way out of paying the pensions to fund current services. So what we've said, no, no, no. Let's come up with a payment plan that actually gets the pension systems healthy and allows you to fund current services, right? We, we call that common sense. <laughs> so first thing, re-amortize the pension debt. Second thing, we need to expand our state sales tax base to include services. And not all services, consumer services. Why? Well, there are four principles of good tax policy, and you, one of them is you need your tax system to be stable. And at the state level, the way you're supposed to generate stable revenue is through your sales tax. It can generate stable revenue if you broadly tax everything consumers really purchase in the consumer economy. How do I know that? Well, 68 to 70 percent of our economy is consumer spending, and even during the Great Recession, but economic dips generally, consumer spending doesn't fall off the map. It dips a little tiny bit. In fact, in the Great Recession, it dipped by 0.6%. So if you broadly tax what consumers really buy in the consumer economy, you've got a stable revenue source that's there during bad cycles. Very important for state governments, which aren't supposed to general, uh, deficit spend, number one. And number two, when revenues go down during a recession, they see demand for services spike up, which, by the way, is 180 degrees from the private sector economic model, right? Because whenever in the private sector demand is going up for your product or services, your revenues are going up because you're selling more of it. So you could staff up to meet that demand. People don't understand when they say, run your government like a business, finance it like a business, they, well, they're different models. <laughs> you can't. You gotta have tax policy that works. So if we broadly taxed what consumers really buy in the consumer economy, we'd be pretty good at having a stable system. We don't, though. 45 states have a broad sales tax that covers a lot of different things. Our base is 45th most narrow. We exclude virtually all services from our sales tax and focus it on products like my tie, this coat, that computer. That's a problem. The reddish orangey bar is the percentage of the Illinois economy made up by products, what we actually tax with our sales tax. Look how that's declined over time. Now it's down to 17% of our economy. What we don't tax is services. That's 72%. Anyone have any questions for why that doesn't work? <laughs> yeah. So net, 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 we need to include services in our sales tax base. Not business to business, not healthcare, not professional. Things like haircuts, lawn care, bowling, health clubs, auto repair, consumer services. Will that suddenly make us tax No. 
fact, not only do we have the most narrow sales tax base in the nation, we have the most narrow sales tax base in the Midwest. All of our neighboring states tax services more than we do. In fact, Iowa and Wisconsin tax all of them. Have you seen busloads of people from Iowa and Wisconsin coming here to get their haircut? No? Because they tax them there. Have you seen their haircuts? Tell them to come. They're goofy looking people. But they're not, they're not coming for tax reasons. Second, this will be popular in the room. We need to tax some retirement income. The reason for that... <laughs> the reason for that is there are, it's just too big a part of our base of income to leave it out. 41 states have an income tax for one of only three that broadly excludes all retirement income from taxation. On the other hand, we are also one of the most unfair taxing states in the nation. We focus our taxes on low and middle income families and we don't tax more affluent families. So how do you make sure that any inclusion of retirement income in your income tax base doesn't harm fixed income, low income seniors? Well, we've come up with one way of doing it. There's a number of different ways to do it. You can't see it on the map, but what it, what it basically says, if your adjusted gross income from all sources is $50,000 a year or less, we let you keep the full exemption. We will tax 0% of your retirement income. If your income from all sources, AGI, is between fifty dollars and $75,000 a year, then only 25% of your retirement income will be subject to the state's income tax rate, currently 3.75%, but you know, hopefully it goes up a little. If your AGI is between seventy-five and 100000 we would tax half of your retirement income. If you're between 100 and 150,000, we would tax three quarters of your retirement income. At over $150,000 a year, all of your retirement income will be subject to the state's income tax. That generates over a billion dollars, and it taxes very few seniors. So net, 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 it's a crucial thing to add to the pot. That's the tax fairness thing. I'm not gonna get into that. I've talked about increasing taxes. We also have to bump up our, sale, our income tax rate. I'm running out of time, so I'm flipping through slides. We also have to bump up our income tax rate from where it currently is under the phase down, 3.75%, to more like four and a half, maybe even four and three quarters. We don't even have to go back to five. But if we do those steps, expand the sales tax base to services, tax some retirement income, increase the rate a little bit from 3.75 to 4.5 or 4.75 and re-amortize our pension debt. Within two years, the state can pay all its past due bills. No more deficit. That's only if they stop spending. No, it maintains current spending. New spending. They haven't been doing new spending. Have you been paying attention? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Year three, they could start increasing spending on education. In fact, we've got to put about four and a half, four point eight billion more into public education to give every child in our state a meaningful opportunity to learn. Now that extra four point eight billion is possible under the path I just put out there. Don't you think the state should do that? I mean, four point eight billion more in tax revenue sounds like a lot. We have a seven hundred twenty billion dollar economy. It's less than one percent of our economy. Let's get over it and make this investment in our future and our kids. And we could also put about another two, three hundred million into social services where we could care for homebound seniors and adults with developmental disabilities, mental health, child care for single working parents. These things have been so ridiculously cut over the last few years that right now many families with vulnerable populations to care for in their family simply can't do it. And, and Illinois is in a very difficult place. And all of this net tax increase is, like I said, 4.8 to 5.2 billion. It's less than 1% of our economy. It's, it's not gonna create any problems. In fact, I've told you repeatedly during this presentation that there is no correlation between your tax policy and your economic growth. I just wanted to give you one slide that makes that very clear. This compares the nine states in America that have no state income tax at all. So these are the miracle states, Texas, Florida, North Dakota, you know, those states. 
to the nine states in America that not only have a state income tax, but have the highest rates in their state income taxes. Last 10 years, core economic data. Average unemployment rate. The high tax states are the blue, the, the no tax states are the red. Notice the average unemployment rate per year, a virtual tie. Slightly higher in the high tax states, 6.1% to 6.0%, but a statistical tie. <clears throat> Change in real median income over the last 10 years. Well, both lost income because of the Great Recession. The loss in income was slightly worse in the no tax states than in the high tax states, but still a statistical tie. Growth in GDP per capita at the state level. Well, here actually the high tax states outperformed the no tax states in a statistically meaningful way. But net, 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 there's no correlation between your tax policy and what's happening in your economy. Other things matter more, right? Florida's economy does well not because they don't have a state income tax, but because they have nice weather, low housing prices, and a famous rat. That's what they have. <laughs> Texas has natural resources, as does North Dakota. And Texas is now feeling some harm as those natural resource prices go down, despite the fact they have no state income tax. So it's really not tax related what happens in your economy. To really drive that point home, federal taxes are far more significant than state taxes. And they take a bigger bite out of your wallet, they take a bigger bite out of everybody's wallet. Here's what's happened to the national GDP following different tax actions at the federal level. Here you see the 1990 George Bush senior tax increase and the economy grew. And then the next dot, that's Bill Clinton's bigger tax increase. The economy not only grew, it peaked. Then the dot-com boom went away, right? All those businesses lost their money. We went into that mild recession in early 2000. George W. Bush came in and cut taxes and nothing. Then he greatly accelerated and increased his tax cuts and the economy tanked. And by the way, this only goes through 05. That does not include the Great Recession. Where is your argument that cutting taxes is that magic panacea that'll grow the economy? I've said this before, but I'm going to say it here. No data at all support that argument. If you want to have a growing economy, the important thing from a tax policy standpoint is to just get it right so that you could make adequate investments in core services, you could build your infrastructure, you could educate your kids. Those are the things that matter from an economic standpoint and a public policy standpoint. Illinois has held itself back by having poor tax policy. It's borrowed against its pensions, it's underfunded its schools, it's contributed to the significant growth in the wage gap between whites and minorities. We could fix all that by modernizing our tax code. I think it's time to grow up and do it. Thank you for listening. Do you want to take questions? We've got time for a couple of questions. So, anybody got a couple of good ones? Yes. Stand up, please. Yeah. Oh, yes. All over the state. Yes, I have. So, have I done this presentation for elected officials? Yes. Countless times. And generally speaking, unless someone is incredibly ideological, in other words, all taxes bad, all government spending bad, and we have a few people like that that are elected officials, but not many. Unless they're in that camp, the reception is generally, well, yeah, it's very logical, it makes sense, I know we need to do it, but my constituents won't support it, and they don't get it. And, and here's, the, here's why I'm actually, a little sympathetic to that argument. None of these folks in Springfield, maybe there's one or two, Don Clark Netch in the past, but none of, none of these folks really ran for office to fix fiscal policy, right? They ran for different reasons. They cared about a community center or caring for whatever, and that's what they wanna do. 
And if they get voted out of office because their constituents don't understand tax policy, they take a hard vote, they don't get to do what they wanted to do. So it's on the grassroots level that a bigger difference has to be made. Folks have to visit their elected officials in their district office and say, we will support you if you do these couple of things on tax policy. We will make sure you get reelected. That's really all it's gonna take to push that needle forward. I was told, do you all know who Mike Lawrence is? You know Mike Lawrence. Do you all know who Mike Lawrence is? Okay, so he was Governor Edgar's press secretary for a while and sometimes correspondent in Springfield for years and then he headed the Senator Simon Institute at Southern Illinois University. Mike pulled me aside once and said, you know, Martiri, I can tell you how to pass your entire program with 80 to 90 percent of all legislators in both parties voting for it in less than five minutes. I'm all ears? What? It says promise them a confidential vote. They get you right, but they are being held up truly by politics, by concerns in their own community. So that's just how real it is that your involvement is now what moves the needle forward. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 